Welcome to this evening's panel. My name is Abraham Castillo. I'm one of the educational advisors in the counseling department at Bakersfield College. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Sean todos bienvenidas y bienvenidos. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our second day of this uh, fourth annual Just Nieto Memorial Conference. Uh, for those of you that may not know who Just Nieto was, Dr. Nieto first introduced uh, Chicana Chicana Studies to Bakersfield College in 1972. And this conference focuses on a variety of topics in history, ethnic studies, and the arts, and civil rights, and education to continue the legacy of Dr. Nieto by bringing together uh, scholars and speakers on, on these and other topics. Um, we have today some Bakersfield College uh, alumnus and current uh, uh, educators. We'll begin with uh, Linda Esquivel, because she is on Central Daylight Time. She is joining us from uh, the state of Illinois. Linda Naomi Esquivel is an alumnus of Bakersfield College and graduated in 2016 and transferred to UCLA where she majored in history and minored in labor and workplace studies. She's currently a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago where she studies the history of agricultural capitalism and labor. Um, I'll introduce Brenda Valadez next, who is one of our adjunct instructors in communication studies and is currently our faculty advisor for Latinas Unidas at Bakersfield College. Uh, Brenda earned her MS and MA from CSU Northridge. She is a recipient of the Norman Levin Center for the Humanities Faculty Grant to conduct research on, quote, significant but unknown Latina leaders, end quote. Her presentation will be on the diverse activist career of Lupe Anguiano a significant but largely unknown civil rights and social justice activist from Ventura County. And to close our panel tonight, we have another one of our BC uh, proud adjunct instructors, Omar Gonzalez, professor of history at Bakersfield College. Omar earned two associate degrees at Sacramento City College, a BA from Sacramento State and an MA from CSU Bakersfield. He teaches Chicano history and Latin American history here at BC. And his research presentation will be on Mexican boxing history. I'm excited to hear all of these. Um, he will discuss his research and its connection to his current teaching curriculum development. His current teaching goals seek to engage intersectional themes such as gender, ethnicity, and identity in an innovative curriculum for student success in higher education. So with that said, I'd like to give the floor to Linda to take it away. Please remember to uh, address any questions you might have in the chat box. We will have a session for Q&A once all of our speakers have gone. So Linda, floor is yours. Thank you. Is there a way that I can, okay, there it is. Uh, perfect. Okay, hi everyone. So my name is um, Linda Esquivel. Um, I am a graduate from Bakersfield Co College. So I'm super excited to be here today. Um, you know, unfortunately, my topic is really depressing, so I want to apologize for that. Um, and I want to start by kind of giving you all a very kind of brief introduction as to why I came to this research. Uh, my parents came to this country as farm workers, and so that always made me want to understand why it was that these um, workers were so heavily policed. Additionally, I always said that I would never do the history of farm workers, so I think I kind of doomed myself there. Um, and so before I begin, I also do want to issue a disclaimer. Um, my topic does, I mean, this presentation is going to be laden with a lot of like heavily racialized language, and I do not mean to insult anyone. And I did go back and forth as to whether or not I should include it. But ultimately, I decided that it is arguably um, irresponsible not to be, you know, pretty honest about just how racialized migrant enforcement um, has been in this country. Um, so with that, I'm going to begin. Um, okay, so 29 days after the World Health Organization declared that the COVID-19 outbreak had transformed into a global pandemic, and the United States instituted a nationwide lockdown. Dozens of incarcerated hunger strikers shuffled into the Bakersfield Mesa Verde Immigration Processing Center's courtyard. Under the watchful gaze of the current youth abolitionist drone, the detainees staged an outdoor sit-in in an attempt to draw national attention to lethal conditions they faced inside the center. Despite global health warnings, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, uh, made little to no attempt to protect detainees from contracting the deadly COVID-19 virus. 
Instead, as the Los Angeles Times would later report, um, officers ignored social distancing measures. They cycled new inmates through the facility, lied about the center's conditions um, to the press, and deliberately, li deliberately limited um, inmates' access to testing. In the weeks that followed, over half of the Mesa Verde population became infected with the COVID-19 strain. In response to the facility's rapidly declining conditions, the American Civil Liberties Union attempted to obtain the release of Mesa Verde's most vulnerable inmates. Among them was 74-year-old Chong Won An, who suffered from underlying heart conditions. Despite his delicate condition, federal, federal officers uh, denied An's request for um, bail release and opted to place him in medical isolation. Four days later, on May 17, 2020, An killed himself within the walls of the private prison. Now, the Bakersfield Mesa Verde Ice Processing Center was first constructed in 2004 following the September 11th terrorist attacks and the subsequent, cre subsequent creation of the Department of Homeland Security. But the region's history of migrant detainment and deportation is far older. So my research maintains that migrant enforcement in the San Joaquin Valley has been intricately tied with labor enforcement. Who has attempted to control labor flows, how and for what functions has changed over time. In this presentation, I will briefly review three moments in the Valley's history when large-scale localized deportation campaigns were implemented against foreign workers. Now, please keep in mind that this is a very general history and it does not go into the complexities of race-making, statecraft, and law. Um, okay, so I wanna begin with the 1933 cotton strike, which really set the stage for how strikes and labor control would function in the Valley for much of the, 20, for the 20th and 21st centuries. In 1933, members of the Can Cannery Agricultural Workers Industrial Union went on a massive strike, which was met with extreme violence. Vigilante growers were known to shoot and attack strikers with impunity, but some of this violence was perpetrated by local law enforcement. The Kern County Sheriff's Department um, was known to raid a worker's camps. It, they arrested them, uh, they arrested strikers indiscriminately or for speaking Spanish. Um, the department, along with the California Highway Patrol, armed themselves against workers with machine guns and tear gas. They also aided immigration officers um, in located, locating deportable migrants or strikers who accepted federal relief. This is demonstrated in the quote that you see here, which has become infamous. And it reads, you know, we protect, oh, excuse me, we protect our growers here, and there I go. Um, but the Mexicans are trash. We raid them like pigs. Now, the 1933 cotton strike has been brilliantly covered by Deborah Weber in her book, Dark Sweat, White Gold, California Farm Workers, Cotton, and the New Deal. If you'd like to learn more about this event, I would re recommend going to her work. But for now, uh, what I want for us to take away are two main points. First, that local law enforcement has historically been deeply entangled in migrant detention and removal. Second, one of the major lessons workers and growers alike took from the cotton strike was that deport deportability was an effective tool for controlling labor. Now, in the second part of my presentation, I want to provide a brief overview of just how uh, detainment and deportation infrastructures function in the Valley. And I'm going to do this by focusing on an event that occurred uh, between 1952 and 1953. So in 1952, the Bakersfield Californian proudly asserted that, Cal that Kern County is about to show other counties something new in handling the Mexican wetbacks. And that's a direct quote. In the summer of 1952, officers found that local county jail was um, filled to overflowing by captured Mexican migrants. They addressed this problem by building an outdoor stockade to cage unsanctioned workers. Upon its completion, the structure measured 62 by 83 feet and was enclosed by an eight foot steel link fence topped with barbed wire. The collection center, termed El Coral or the wetback stockade, had been devised to cage a large quantity of migrants that had recently begun to overflow the county jail. In the weeks prior, county health officials, sheriffs, and journalists toured the cramped facility and looked on in relative horror as upwards to 186 men were confined into a cell block which had been designed to hold only 36. In addition to alleviating jail congestion, the outdoor structure had been devised as a quick collection and processing center to aid immigration servicemen in the removal of undocumented migrants. 
It is important to note that migrant enforcement and removal was a collective endeavor in the Valley. The INS relied on local law enforcement to capture, cage, guard, and transport migrants. So I want to review some, um, you know, pictures that I found in the Bakersfield Californian from this period, which I think are riveting. Here we see a small snapshot of the congestion, congested jail conditions. Um, here is one of two photos that I've been able to locate of uh, the out, outdoor structure, uh, infrastructure. As you can see, you, uh, there are Mexican migrants here trying to find shelter um, from the sun. As you know, uh, you know, bigger still the summer can get to, you know, three, uh, three digits. Um, so it's quite brutal. Here is a snapshot of what these removal infrastructures look like. Um, we have migrants here being boarded onto um, this charter bus, and they were going to be headed either into uh, California's El Centro det Detention Center or Deportation Center, um, or they're going to be directly um, sent over to Mexico. Um, and this person here, if you can tell from the caption, is not a Border Patrol agent. It's actually a Kern County Sheriff's Officer. And this is an example of the kind of work that they would do on behalf of Border Patrol agents. So they would usually um, oversee these kinds of uh, boarding processes. Sometimes they would uh, accompany Border Patrol agents down to Mexico to help guard uh, officers, I mean, these det detainees. Uh, and then here is a photo that I think is arguably staged, unlike the other, um, uh, staged as if it's real, but, you know, they wanted to get the, the photo off. Um, so unlike the other workers that we saw before, these men have like more traditional gar garbs and um, in line with the capture, caption invaders captured, it kind of is reminiscent of, you know, Pancho Villa and, you know, these, these men are all like they're posed. Um, and if you can't tell, they are where these officers here are wearing a different uniform than this guy, and that's because they are um, police officers from the city of Bakersfield, as a you know, as a caption uh, further elucidates. And I think this is important because it demonstrates that um, you know the interdepartmental um, factions and and uh, you know attempts to like detain migrants were. Um, comprised of you know, various local law enforcement agencies. So the life of El Coral um, appears to have been short-lived. Upon hearing that his compatriots were being detained in an, in an informal enclosure, the Fresno Mexican consul um, protested the town's actions. The city subsequently returned to confining migrants in the county jail. Enforcement continued this way up until um, the next decade and a half, um, and then in 1965, the U.S. Department of, of Justice approved plans to relocate four Border Patrol agents from El Centro to Bakersfield. The officers operated uh, within the Truxton Avenue Federal Building, and while they did have a small holding cell, it wasn't large enough to hold prisoners overnight, so migrants were still being cycled through the ca local county jail. Now, this brings me to the infamous uh, Delano Grape Strike, which unfolded just a few months after the Border Patrol agents came to Bakersfield. So from the 1930s onwards, growers had established a fairly stable access to foreign farm labor through the Bracero program. This program was essentially an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico, which allowed Mexican workers to legally enter into the U.S. and meet alleged labor shortages. So it's no surprise that the repealment of the Bracero program in 1964 had an almost immediate effect on U.S. agricultural labor relations. Unable to rely on Braceros any longer, growers found themselves in serious need of workers. This problem was further intensified when domestic laborers formed uh, the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, now popularly known as the UFW. Um, so in 1965, the UFW organized a strike to obtain higher wages and better working conditions. Cut off from Bracero and domestic labor, um, growers were forced to locate a new supply of workers. As was custom, they looked to the U.S.-Mexico border and contracted both documented and undocumented Mexican strike breakers. So for three years, the union responded by um, asking its broad coalition of supporters to place pressure on the federal government on the federal government so that it would do something about the importation of foreign strike breakers. This brings us to 1968. Now, it's important to note that 1968, much like 2020, was a very tumultuous year. 
this was the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, as was Robert F. Uh, Kennedy, who was a big proponent of farm worker rights. So as a result um, of this and, you know, historical structural inequality, cities across the country were experiencing massive protests, counter reactions and uh, uprisings. So by the time that the U.S. Department of Labor was sent to the Valley to assess the strike-breaking dilemma, they came away with the fear um, that, uh, you know, there was a immediate danger of, of unrest in the Valley. And so they wrote to the Attorney General and they said um, that, and here's the quote, unless far-reaching administrative action is taken and taken soon, there is a real and immediate danger that a solution will be sought in the streets with grave national and international repercussions. As a result, the U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark implemented a micro-localized deportation campaign in the San Joaquin Valley. He ordered a large contingent of immigration officers to Kern County so that they would begin locating and removing migrant strike breakers. The Bakersfield Border Patrol, which had originally been managed by a mere five men, now included upwards 37 officers. The region was further infused with other INS resources and technologies, uh, including charter buses and D-16 spotter airplanes. Additionally, immigration agents were instructed to set up checkpoints along the San Joaquin Valley's main access points, like the Grapevine, and they conducted worksite raids, which mostly took place um, in the fields. The enlarged force located so many people, the service began to arrange airlifts out of Bakersfield's uh, Meadowfields airports, as you can see in the photo here. So for the next year, the next several years, um, the some of these officers were kind of called back um, to the border, but you know, the, excuse me, the office, uh, the office was never reduced to its original size. Um, and it, instead it kind of continued to grow. In 1977, the Bakersfield Border Patrol uh, office was moved from the federal building to an actual like service processing center, um, which was, you know, a, a, a larger building that was able to hold more people. And it was located where uh, Mervyn's used to be, or I think Hobby Lobby is now. Um, so in the q and I'm happy to talk more about what, um, migrant enforcement look like um, in the 70s. Um, but with that, uh, I will leave you to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I think it was going um, just fine if you wanted to take uh, three minutes to for any closing remarks. Thank you, Linda. We'll open it up for Q&A after all our speakers have gone. Again, as a reminder, any questions, please um, bring them up in the chat box. But let's give the floor to Brenda Valadez on her presentation. Take it away, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. So I, before I begin, I want to show everyone this image. And um, many of you will recognize most of the women because people have written things about them. So you'll recognize them as leading feminists, um, such as on the far left, we have um, feminist icon Gloria Steinem next to her with the hat, Bella Abzu. And then behind the podium, we have um, Charlie, um, Charlie, Charlie Chisholm, the first black woman elected to US Congress. And then on the right, we have Betty Friedan, right, the mother of feminism. I put a red mark on the person right here because not many people know about her or have written about her. And my research today is on her. Her name is Lupe Anguiano. And this is one of my favorite pictures of her because she's delivering a speech in Detroit. She's leading the um, Michigan grape boycott. So um, a little bit of my research where it comes from and then why I um, conducted the re research and then we'll get started. So my presentation today is based on archival research from the Lupe Anguiano collection at the UCLA Chicano, um, Chicano Studies Center. Um, you'll see a lot of historical photos, notes, and letters. The, um, I also conducted a personal interview with Lupe Anguiano in February of 2020, right before COVID. And um, I listened to her 2011 UCLA, um, UCLA oral history. 
And why, right? As a faculty advisor of Latinas Unidas and a member of local and statewide Latino organizations, um, it's really important that Latinas feel visible, right? N um, not just in American history, but in politics and academia. And um, why? Because it's very empowering when you feel visible. And a lot of my students, I, I'll ask them the question, this happens every semester where I, I go, hey, um, name a Latina leader. And they have a very difficult time doing this. And most of them say, uh, oh, we have Dolores Huerta, but that's it. So one of the reasons why I'm pursuing this type of research is um, for reasons like that, that um, I want to show um, students and others of our diverse history when it comes to Latina leadership. And this is Lupe Anguiano. She's a civil rights, social justice leader. Today, there's just so much I want to talk about when it comes to um, what she's done. But because of time, there's three things I want to share. I'm going to talk about her religious life and some of her early activism. Followed by that, I want to focus on her career in Washington, DC. And finally, talk about her time with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers movement. Um, so let's start. This is an image of Lupe Anguiano as a little girl. Lupe Anguiano is the um, daughter of Mexican immigrants who were farm workers in Ventura County, California. They lived in a labor camp and then moved to Satacoy. Satacoy is located in Ventura, California. She grew up in Ventura um, County and she graduated high school in 1948. Here's another image of her graduation. Lupe, uh, Lupe Anguiano was um, I'm social. She, she really liked hanging out with her girlfriends. She liked nature, the beach. And once she was done with high school, she informed her friends and her family members that she wanted to become a nun. And most of them didn't believe her. They didn't really take her serious because they, they're, um, they're like, you're way too social. What do you mean you're going to lock yourself lock yourself up in a convent and pray all day. Um, she's the one in the middle. I skipped this. Um, she's the one right in the middle between three friends on the right and three friends on the left. In this image, I like this image. She's looking straight at the camera right here with um, the white sweater. So Lupa was so serious that um, at the age of 19, which was in 1949, Lupe entered religious life. Her religious name was Sister Mary Consuelo, and she was assigned to um, a location in Los Angeles, California. She was heavily influenced by the Vatican II, which had an emphasis on serving the people, the poor, and the underprivileged. So when there was issues in LA with um, the struggles with fair housing, she felt like that commanded her attention. That was um, something that she really believed in the 1963 Rumford Fair Housing Act. She believed that was very necessary because she had seen firsthand Mexican and Blacks being discriminated. So what was she doing about it? She was out there with her habit, her nun habit. Picket, um, she's picketing. She's writing editorials. Um, she's on the picket line writing um, newspaper editorials under her religious name and some, sometimes with just the Lupe Anguiano name. But the Catholic Church did not like this media attention. Um, and she was reprimanded. She was told, you're not an activist. You know, you're a nun. What are you doing? And um, at the time, the Catholic Church was building schools in Los Angeles and had relationships with realtors and developers. So they didn't like this media coverage, right? Imagine, like, a nun out there. Um, she's um, on the protesting, basically. And what happens is, um, there's a quote that I want to read, and it's from the Lupe Anguiano UCLA oral history to help you understand kind of like the pressure she was getting, not just verbally, but in writing from um, her local um, bishop. A quote. She recalls, quote, 
Bishop Timothy Manning wrote to her that it was not appropriate to be involved in political act action activities, but Lupe um, saw, said, we saw what we were doing in open housing as a social action, not political, an area for everyone to have equal opportunity to move into housing and grow and to do away with the barrios, the graffiti in East LA and the gangs, end quote. After a year of being reprimanded by the local bishop and her nun superior, Lupe makes a very difficult decision to leave religious life. She leaves her service with the Catholic Church. Um, she had been a nun for 15 years, so it was a very difficult decision, but she did not want to be silenced on matters of equality. So she leaves. Um, and um, that's just a little bit about her religious life. Um, I now want to talk about her career in Washington, D.C., but before I get into that, um, when she leaves religious life, it's not like she goes straight to work in uh, Washington, D.C. She has to now get a job to pay rent, right? Because now she's not with the Catholic Church. That you know, Now she has to pay her rent, buy food, and all that stuff. So she gets a job in Los Angeles with um, as a counselor with a program called Teen Post. So she's working with the youth in Los Angeles, and she learns a lot about some of the issues with education right, such as the really high dropout rates at the time. And through this work, um, she networks. And um, this is also a time like in 1965, where there's the Watts riots, and then the grape strike in California. So what happens is President Johnson in 1966 wants delegates from California to join him for a White House conference regarding issues related to Mexican Americans. And Lupe is one of the delegates and one of the only women, I believe, that gets invited to go to Washington, DC. So she goes and one of the very first things that all the delegates without any agenda or any, any type of brainstorming, they all know that the number one issue in California facing Mexican American is educational discrimination against the youth. Um, it, you know, like how, uh, I believe there's like a 50% dropout rate at the time. And there was these um, racist laws that really disturbed Lupe. And she talks about these in some of her um, uh, um, interviews. She talks about what's called at the time, um, and excuse me if this, some of you find this offensive, the rent, um, um, the um, mental retardation. This is a law that allowed teachers to determine if students needed to be placed in special education based on language deficiency alone, All right? So she's very bothered by this. Some of the delegates as well are very bo bothered that, you know, um, some of the Spanish speaking students were being placed in special ed. So you have, you know, a teacher that doesn't speak Spanish, a student that's learning English and the teacher says, well, I can't communicate with you, so you're gonna go to special education. This was a big problem. So um, she was very vocal during this conference and it caught many pe people's attention. So in 67, 1967, Congressman Edward Roy Ball and um, George Brown elector or um, send her to the Office of Education to help build the Bilingual Education Act. So she's under the Johnson administration. And the way she envisions bilingual education is, um, it's bilingual education, bicultural education. That's how she was envisioning that. And she got ideas from different things she was witnessing living on the other side of the country, such as the way that the ambassador's children were getting an education, right? They were um, in class learning two languages, right? The foreign language being English and then their native tongue. And on top of that, they were all sharing things about their cultures with each other. But what happens is that at the end, she, uh, the final product of bilingual education, she was not happy. Um, her vision of bilingual bicultural education was changed to what we know now as ESL, which are not the same thing. And um, she's, she's upset, she leaves Washington and um, of course the Bilingual Education Act passes in 1968, but she's disappointed, she leaves. And then there's like a, a gap 
in between um, she, her leaving the first time Washington and then returning a second time. I will talk about what she's doing in that year in just a bit. Um, I now wanna talk about her second time around. She comes back to Washington under a different administration. It's the Nixon administration that brings her on to be part of the Office of Civil Rights and they appoint her to the women's program. So she becomes very involved with um, the women's movement and some of the leading feminists that help, um, she and the other leading feminists help develop what's called the Women's Political Caucus. And this um, Women's Political Caucus is, um, is very important, right? It's a time where um, the women's movement are, um, um, very supportive of the Equal Rights Amendment. And for those of you who are like, what is the Equal Rights Amendment? Or you'll hear me abbreviate the ERA. It's an amendment to the constitution that would um, grant equality between the sexes. And of course it was controversial. Some people who were against the Equal Rights Amendment believed it was a cover for abortion rights. And Lupe, what she tried to do is, this is Lupe with her colleagues in DC, what she tried to do is she tried to reach out to um, her networks. This is a letter that she wrote to an organization called Padres, and it's a uh, it's an organ it's a religious organization for Mexican American and Hispanic priests. And she's just advocating for the Equal Rights Amendment here. This is another letter that she writes to other religious leaders, and um, right here, um, she, she I mean she knew who wasn't. Uh, there were some religious leaders very against the Equal Rights Amendment. And in this case, um, she's writing to a group who supports it, but their bishop doesn't. So in the letter, she, it says, I know it's kind of small, but it says, feel free to use these ideas, etc. But please keep the letters from the bishop confidential. And she puts quotes, this is very important, please call me if you have a question about this. So, you know, she's really smart about, <laughs> you know, advocating, but knowing, um, just you know, knowing, okay, we're not going to tell this person. She learned from previously um, being part of being a nun. Um, so that's a little bit of her time during um, her career in Washington. I now want to um, finish with her time with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers movement. This is a picture that is in her archives. I, I like this picture. It has the um, United Farm Workers flag right here. And then if you get close, like who's in the background, we have Bobby Kennedy right in the middle, uh, Dolores Huerta, and at, in the far left, you see um, Larry Itliong. There is also um, the Virgen de Guadalupe, a lot of roses. It's a really nice, uh, I'm sorry, flowers. <laughs> and um, it's a really nice image. But during, um, during that gap time, when she leaves, when she leaves DC disappointed in, um, the product of bilingual education the first time that she goes to Washington, DC. There's like this moment where she leaves and she joins, she, she becomes a full-time volunteer for the United Farm Workers. And this is in 1968 when she's doing this. Um, she, uh, let me see, yeah. So there's a moment where um, Cesar Chavez is telling her, I want you to go to Detroit. And she's kind of like, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to appoint. It really encourages her to go. And um, it's a good thing that he did because she was very successful in Michigan. The um, great boycott was a success. Lupe was able to build coalition with the United Auto Workers so much that they donated enough money for her to buy a car for UFW or um, the boycott activities that she's doing throughout Michigan. Um, she's really smart about building coalitions in Detroit. She knows a local bishop. So through the local bishop, she gets acquainted with a local government. And now you have the bishop and the local government. Um, not, they're not eating grapes, right? It's, a, I believe, one third cut of great consumption in Michigan, which is, it's a big deal, right? So that's just a little bit about um, Lupe and her time with Cesar Chavez, the great boycott, her time in Detroit. Uh, this is my last slide, um, and then I'll let Omar go. 
I don't want to take too much time, but this is the last part. This is, um, I conducted a personal interview with Lupe Anguiano um, right before COVID in February, 2020. I, I drove up to Oxnard and, you know, it was a nice day. I was even wearing a sweater because I left Baker, so I was cold. And then I get to Oxnard and it's really hot. So um, this is her. She's about, uh, at the time, 90 or 91. And she's still uh, a social justice leader. She's at nine in her 90s doing so much. Is there something I didn't get to talk about today? But I want to end with um, something that I had to reflect on in my classroom. Um, a couple of semesters ago, um, I, I gave a survey in my class because I noticed something happening every semester. Um, so I wanted to find out more and get it in writing. Um, I, asked, I gave my students a survey asking them to list leaders. And this was an easy question. Most of them were able to list a lot of leaders, especially leaders they can, uh, men. They were able to list men. I then asked them to list Latino leaders and they struggled a bit, but they came up with Cesar Chavez, right? <laughs> then I asked them one last question. Can you list Latina leaders? And this was a really hard question for every single one of my students. They were not able to do that. Maybe one or two um, said Dolores Huertas, but most of them left it blank. And I said, why is this question blank? Can you explain? And they said, we just, there's none. We can't think of any, right? That was their, uh, what they responded. So I did a demo for them. I did a, a speech uh, um, on Lupe Anguiano. And after the speech, I gave them a second survey and I asked questions related to my speech and what they thought. And many were upset that it took so long to learn about Lupe Anguiano. Many even said, why didn't we learn this in high school? Others said, why aren't other teachers teaching us about the contributions of Latinos and Latinas? So at the moment, there was this disappointment from my students. And it, I remembered something Lupa said in one of her interviews. Um, I don't remember if it was the personal interview right now or something in her oral history. But she said, education has really failed our students. And this was what my students were communicating on that day. So I, I, I hope you all enjoyed my presentation. That's the end. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you, Brenda. That was excellent. Okay. And uh, to close, Omar Gonzalez on History of Boxing. Omar, if you're ready, your floor is yours. And uh, keep the questions coming, everyone, or the questions. We're going to get to our Q&A session uh, in a moment. Everybody hear me? Pretty good. All right, so let's see if we can follow two great presentations. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Mexican boxing history, and we're going to look at it through an ethnic studies lens, and also how it relates to me personally in terms of why I chose to uh, research uh, the topic, and also how it relates to uh, my teaching career and, uh, of course, students, because that's uh, very important, of course, as an educator. Here's a, a poster that uh, I want to share with everybody um, that represents a little bit about my family history and represents uh, some key aspects of my research um, that relate to this, uh, um, this topic here, which is masculine identity and fatherhood as well. And if you look closely, uh, you see this name here. It says Federico Gonzalez. El Terror de Wanusco. And this is just a poster that symbolizes the family history uh, that I have uh, related to boxing. And although my family kind of downplays the significance of this, um, this is an uncle of mine that used to box back in Mexico, back in Zacatecas, where my family's from. When my aunt first showed me this, I got so excited because my father, as um, you know, when I was a, a young uh, kid, that's how we connected a lot. Right. And uh, being from a Mexican uh, household, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a standard masculine, you know, uh, culture uh, that you don't really talk too much about emotions, things like that. But one of the ways that we did connect was through our uh, love of boxing. And I learned that from my father and, um, you know, getting inspiration from this poster when my aunt showed me this, um, which was back in 1962 when this took place. And then also the connection that I have with my father and our love of boxing really inspired sort of this research 
and uh, my studies in boxing. Um, and I also box myself. So that's one of the reasons I did this research. Um, I never boxed professionally. I dealt with too many uh, health issues and never found an opportunity to do so. But um, but uh, it was something that I continued to do throughout my studies. And I, I, I still, uh, you know, take a particular, um, you know, focus on boxing in my, you know, uh, you know, extracurricular activities that include health. And uh, I hope to bring that to student communities uh, one day. Um, and I mentioned fatherhood because um, while I was working on this research um, back in 2016, 2017, uh, my father was not just an inspiration behind this research from our conversations in boxing um, and things like that, but my father had a heart attack um, in 2017 and uh, he had to have, um, you know, a bypass surgery and uh, long story short, um, he turned out to be okay. Um, and that was a very scary moment for me, but it was in the process of, of conducting his research and there was trauma within the research from, uh, uh, you know, reading about some of these boxing stories and I'll get to why in a minute, but just that traumatic experience of, you know, that fear of losing my father and losing that connection, um, that was a, a very um, traumatic time period, but also very uh, significant for this project. Um, Here's uh, the title of my uh, research that I did, which focuses on death in boxing. And so I studied uh, boxing with a particular lens that focused on death. Um, and I focused on ethnic Mexican boxing. Um, and I looked at the way that uh, violent boxers, um, you know, uh, conducted violence, of course, in the ring, because that's the nature of the sport. Uh, but what did that violence mean beyond the ring? Now, there's been several studies on the sport of what violence means beyond the ring, the social implications of the sport. Um, but there wasn't much research on what death meant for the sport that didn't focus on uh, regulating the sport, right? Ideas about the sport being uncivilized for society, progressive reformers during different time periods throughout the sport's history, calling for its abolition and things like that or the focus on reforming the sport, et cetera. No one had really looked at the sport um, through the death, through death and the lens, and that lens, um, and focused on what that meant for masculine fighters, right, and their identity. Um, and this uh, took on many forms, um, you know, and again, I focused on ethnic Mexican boxing, which was a transnational perspective. And what I did was I looked at several um, international uh, publications, which of course included uh, newspaper publications. Right here, here's a, um, a newspaper clipping from, I believe this one's from El Informador, uh, which was one of the newspapers that I used. And that one's based out of Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. Mexico. And um, boxing is a very uh, you know international sport, um, other than soccer and football or football, it's one of the sports that helped Mexico propel itself on the international stage, right? And promote Mexican nationalism. And this fight here that you see here on the screen is not the one I'm gonna focus on for this uh, short presentation, but it's one of the fights that I talk about where I focus on um, a Mexican boxer. In this case, it was an, a boxer from Mexico City, Guadalupe Pintor, who um, ended up tragically, um, you know, uh, causing his opponent to eventually die from his injuries through the ring. Um, now, what did this research bring up? Well, it uh, I didn't really know this at the time initially when I started this research, but um, it opened up a whole world of ethnic studies for me in terms of looking at how boxing uh, sheds light on the social significance of the sport for ethnic Mexicans, especially in Southern California. Uh, here's a couple of newspaper clippings from La Opinion, which is a Spanish uh, newspaper uh, publication in Los Angeles, where Mexican boxing uh, really uh, took off um, in the middle of the 20th uh, uh, century. Um, Mexican boxing uh, really established itself uh, post-World War II. Um, a lot of fighters came over from Mexico and fought in Southern California. 
um, it was a place where public spectacle started to um, gain some notoriety. And uh, prior to this time period in the late 50s, it started in the 1940s, but as, as I mentioned, it was post-World War II era, era. But really in the late 50s, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and so forth, um, Mexican boxing began to dominate in Southern California. And most notably, this took place in the lower weight divisions. Uh, before that, the focus was a lot on the heavyweight divisions, right? You know, World War II, there was a lot of social implications, international implications with fights like Joe Lewis versus Max Schmeling, right? You had the fighter from Germany and uh, an American fighter, uh, Joe Lewis at the time. There was, of course, implications there with the uh, conflict, uh, the World War II conflict going on. Um, but in this time period, you start to see uh, ethnic Mexicans uh, coming over, um, you know, uh, fighting in Southern California. And then you also have, by this time, uh, Mexican-Americans established in Southern California. And so you start to see a lot of bouts that take place in the bantamweight divisions, the featherweight divisions, the lower weight classes. And you have a second golden age of boxing. And it was headed by uh, Mexicans, really. So when international fighters would come and fight in the United States and you fought in uh, Southern California and places like the Grand Olympic Auditorium, um, at Dodger Stadium, at Chavez Ravine, um, you were basically fighting in the backyard of, uh, of a Mexican, right? Whether they were Chicano or Mexican immigrants. And uh, the aficionados or the fan base at this point was largely a mix, right, of ethnic Mexicans who were either, you know, Mexican-American living there for quite a while in neighborhoods like Chava Ravine, you know, some for the San Fernando Valley and so forth, and then others who were recent migrants uh, from Mexico. And the fight that I'll focus on here today to talk to you a little bit about the research that I did um, that focused on some of those uh, key components of this research, which was death, um, what death signified beyond regulation and uh, morality of the sport. Um, basically things that you would normally associate with violent men and masculinity, which we'll talk a little bit about that, is this fight here, um, which was Ultiminio Sugar Ramos. Um, and uh, you see the headlines here, it says Rodriguez, Ramos y Cruz se coronan campeones. And it's fascinating because that uh, day in 1963, around, I think it was two or three Cubans um, uh, won the title and became champions that day. And uh, I mentioned Cuba because uh, Ramos was actually uh, Cuban. But by this point, uh, the revolution had taken place in Cuba. Um, uh, you know, Cuban boxers uh, weren't able to fight professionally anymore after uh, Castro had abolished professional boxing, prize fighting in the Cuban island, and some of them would eventually continue their careers in Miami, in Florida, or some of them went to Mexico City. And so when uh, the fighter that I talk about today uh, achieved the victory um, and became a champion, um, he not only became a Cuban champion, but fighting out of Mexico, he established himself as a Mexican champion and gained uh, national recognition and symbolized a uh, uh, sort of a victory uh, for Mexican boxing. Um, and Mexico City was a good place for him to go to continue his career because, um, you know, they both have Spanish colonial origins, uh, similar cultures, Catholic cultures, similar masculine cultures, and also similar boxing cultures. Um, and then Mexico had a lot of uh, fighters in the same weight divisions. So he had good training grounds and a good place to continue his prize fighting career. Um, and so, this, uh, uh, the process of researching um, these, these fights and the focus on death here really illuminated uh, sort of an ethnic studies and a Latino and Mexican boxing um, focus uh, because it showed me the intricacies of, of fighting identity, especially transnational identity and representation um, for some of these fighters. And again, I talk about many fighters uh, I focused on two particular fighters specifically in the research. There was more that I wanted to uh, to focus on, but there are just uh, f so many stories out there. But again, taking a particular focus on death allowed me to kind of focus in on some of this research um, or some of these specific fights, rather. Um, here's a little more details of the specific fight that I focused on and the specific 
uh, Cuban Mexican um, that I want to talk to you about today. So this fight takes place in 1963, March 21st, and it takes place at Chávez Ravín or Dodger Stadium. Right, Chávez Ravín, referring to the neighborhood that was displaced, Mexican neighborhood that was displaced uh, in order to make way for Dodger Stadium. Um, and here's a newspaper clipping from the Los Angeles Times um, talking about uh, Davy Moore's injury. Um, long story short, Davy Moore goes into a coma after a brutal fight. And keep in mind that Davy Moore is a champion in this fight. He's 26 years old. He's from Ohio. He's the champion, American, African-American fighter. He's um, the favorite. And he loses his bout. And Ramos uh, becomes the youngest, at the time, he becomes the youngest featherweight champion uh, at 21 years of age. Um, and again, he's Cuban, but this victory also symbolized victory for Mexico. So what's the sig significance of uh, Ramos and this victory? Well, for starters, uh, interestingly enough, as I did the research, um, this wasn't his first um, uh, associated tra tragedy with his career. Um, he actually had a fight with a man named Jose El Tigre Blanco uh, back in Cuba in 1959, I believe it was, in, I think it was Havana. And that fighter also died from his injuries. And so I talk a little bit about the research of how that kind of messes with your psyche and how did that... Uh, affects a masculine fighter because these are masculine characters, right? They're they're violent actors, right? It's within a, a, a structured setting, right, of, of a violent sport. But nonetheless, right, they train for violence. But what does that mean beyond the ring? And how does that affect a person's masculinity as a, as a prize fighter and as a man? Um, and despite the two deaths on his record, um, he was still able to continue his career and eventually become a Hall of Fame fighter. And again, representing uh, Cuba, but uh, predominantly also Mexican boxing. Um, and I'll sh share some quotes in a minute um, as to how that was able to come to fruition with the support system he had from uh, his own family, but also the family members of the people that he, um, you know, uh, fought uh, during his uh, time as a as a prize fighter. Um, so as I mentioned, the similar cultures allowed uh, Ramos to establish himself as a Mexican champion. And he was also able to assimilate into the Mexican culture. And ethnic boxing comes into play here because a lot of these fighters, uh, whether they were Chicano or Mexican, Cuban-Mexican in this case, would fight in Los Angeles because that was sort of the, the mecca for Mexican boxing um, throughout that time period. Um, and I bring up issue of identity as well um, in some cases, there's issues of identity between the fan base as well, right? Because ethnic Mexicans who are living in Southern California, who are spectating these fights in places like the Grand Olympic Auditorium and Chava Ravine and other venues throughout uh, Southern California have dilemmas, right? Uh, one of the more, more recent examples um, in more recent history is, for example, when Oscar de la Hoya, or the Golden Boy, uh, fought Julio Cesar Chavez. Right there's dilemma as to okay who should I be rooting for? I'm Chicano, but I Cesar Chavez is considered one of the best uh, boxers, if not the best Mexican fighter of all time. So there's dilemma there, right? Identity, uh, association, acculturation, uh, you name it. Um, here's a little uh, example of where that also uh, played a key role in the fight in a fight associated with uh, Sugar Ramos. Later on in his career, in 1970, he fights uh, uh, Armando Mando Ramos. And here's a, a quick little picture of the ticket of the fight, or a little poster uh, for the fight that took place in 1970. And Mando Ramos was from Long Beach, so he's a Chicano fighter and was one of the best lightweights at the time. And Ramos is fighting him. And again, he has that Cuban-Mexican background. There was dilemma, right? from Chicano fan base, uh, Mexican fan base, I think Mexicans, Mexican immigrants, who are we rooting for here? Um, do we root for the Chicano who is uh, of Mexican background or do we root for the Cuban Mexican who's technically Cuban, but he represents Mexico because he's fighting uh, technically out of Mexico City, right? So there's uh, those dilemmas there that uh, explore in my research too, the issues of identity that also relate to uh, the main uh, topics of uh, the research that I conducted. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, 
death and the vulnerability was a key aspect of the research, especially again with the um, trauma with my father. And death was a, a, a point conversation that always came up in our conversations with boxing. Um, fighters like uh, Kiko Vejines, um, you know, who had died at the hands of uh, Alberto Davila, uh, who was a Chicano fighter. Um, you know, you had plenty of fighters who have died throughout the years um, uh, due to, uh, you know, uh, Mexican fighters, etc. Um, so it was always a conversation that always came up uh, uh, with me and my father. So I was also an inspiration for this uh, project. But what are some of the gendered implications? Because this was a piece on gender, right? Um, the focus, of course, is masculinity here. Um, not to take away uh, from the importance of women, but one of the things I do talk about in the research as well is that um, women's studies actually paved the way for analysis such as this that focus on men because, um, you know, gendered approaches to history is very important, whether you're talking about women or men. Um, and in this case, uh, the idea is here, what are gendered implications for violent men? Uh, vulnerability, contradictions, right, uh, of violent sporting men, respect, religious, spiritual, um, religious, spiritual uh, implications as well. And some of the ones that um, I focused on um, were uh, especially on Ramos, right? And how he kind of got through those deaths, because again, he's one of the only recorded fighters who has uh, two deaths on his on his record. Um, there may be more, right? But uh, for my research, those are the, he's the one that uh, I focused on, at least on record. Um, and I won't read the entire quotes here um, in the interest of time, but just to paraphrase, the first quote is from Ramos and he talks about how he would have nightmares and excuse me, crying controllably and think about uh, the implications of those two fights. Or I think that quote is referring to the fight with El Tigre de Blanco that took place back in, in Cuba. And so that was very um, uh, you know, tough to kind of get through despite, uh, you know, um, it being a part of his life, right, the career in boxing, because this also is a way for them to provide for the families and uh, exercise their skills. Or, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a meaning uh, beyond the violence, right? The second quote um, talks about how he received a visit from uh, Blanco's mother, and she basically told him, hey, like, I forgive you. It wasn't, you know, on purpose, that kind of thing. And she also tells him that, you know, you need to continue fighting and you need to continue the success uh, and fight in honor of Jose and carry that with you. And he did. He was able to kind of carry that. And, uh, and as I mentioned before, he became a Hall of Fame fighter eventually. And that was very important for this, uh, this uh, particular case study. Um, and then this last quote is from when he... Um, inflicted uh, fatal injuries to uh, Davey Moore, the fighter from Ohio. Um, he had a visit from Moore's wife one day in training camp, and she didn't blame him, right? She talked about how, um, you know, she thought it was an act of God, and that's where I bring up the religious component, because a lot of this is very spiritual, right? They rely on that because some of these things are somewhat explainable because of the, uh, you know, of course, the dangerous implications of the sport but uh you know in some cases you can't really um you know they do medical examinations etc and they can't really um you know see exactly what happened um and it was sort of a god's act in her eyes so just to say that this is uh some of the important aspects of the research that took place that um shows a little more of um what boxing signifies right besides death and then I'll quickly finish with, here are some of the other significance of the sport in terms of the, uh, that I like to share with my students, uh, local component, right? Ruben Castillo, who he fought out of Bakersfield, California, fought one of the best fighters of all time in Salvador Sanchez. Um, that was an important uh, case study also. Um, Corky Gonzalez ended up becoming a social activist uh, for the Chicano movement, which is very important. Um, and then I'll finish with, um, and in the at the risk of um, you know uh, self promotion here, um, what does this mean for education and boxing? Well, um, here's a quick little picture of of me and doing vocational boxing here at uh, community college where I implemented some of these uh, practices um, 
um, vocationally, right? Now it's not just uh, in the books and research. I never got to do it professionally, things like that, but it's still something that I envision and hope to uh, bring that to some students one day um, at higher in higher education, uh, because uh, things like diversity, uh, student health, and ethnic studies all relate to this um, this topic of boxing, right? In this research, so uh, you know, thank you for your time today. Very cool. Thank you, Omar, and thank you to all our participants. I want to just quickly jump into the Q and A in the interest of time. And the first question um, we have is uh, for Linda. And Linda, someone wants to know: Can Linda talk about her archival research process? And also, how does your research on the San Joaquin Valley fit with how other scholars discuss immigration regimes and enforcement in the 20th and 21st centuries? You can go with the first one if you'd like first. Um, can you talk a little bit about your research process? Yeah, I can. And like, fortunately, my cat's asleep now, so I shouldn't be jumping around everywhere. Um, so most of my carver research has um, occurred within the Walter Ruther Library, which is at Wayne, which is in Wayne State, which is located in Detroit, and it houses all of the United Farm Worker papers. Um, I've also gone to the Texas AFL-CIO collection, which is in the uh, University of Texas Arlington, um, and I reviewed like multiple case files, kind of that which cover strike breaker regulations, um, you know, the California Rural Legal Assistance attempts to um, file class action suits against growers for um, hiring undocumented workers. So these cases file like occur, you know, locally um, within the uh, Ninth Circuit Court or through the appeals process in the state court, in the, U the U.S. District Court, and then finally into in the Supreme Court. And I also look at administrative regulations. Um, and I try not to, you know, go into this at all because I know people's like eyes are just gonna glaze over. Um, but a lot of, this is gonna go to the next um, question as well, is that a lot of what I do looks at how um, the INS itself as an administrative body creates rules which regulate um, migrants. And, um, and so through that, and, and in that way, they're able to like create um, rules as who is able to enter and under what conditions, as well as how they can be deported, that kind of falls outside of what Congress has said. So it's not exactly in the national you know, immigration legislation, but it is technically legal. So it kind of operates in this very kind of formal, informal um, uh, uh, legal jurisdiction. Um, so, and then that kind of goes into how my work is different or um, kind of expands upon or complicates existing um, histories. So I definitely do align with what some immigration histories have, you know, said so far. For example, Kaylida Hernandez has a great um, overview of how um, after 1965, um, the Border Patrol begins to engage in both migrant and crime policing. So they're trying to stop, um, you know, border, I mean, excuse me, drug trafficking and um, and such. So I look at different like case studies of that occurring in Bakersfield itself. Um, but I think it's different in the sense that one, no one's really ever talked about border patrol stations that are located in the interior. After all, you know, Bakersfield is 200 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border. There's border patrol stations in like Fresno, um, I think Salinas at some point, um, as well as other small farm, farming counties in the San Joaquin Valley. And so I'm trying to understand why they ended up there, what were the legal justifications, um, and what they were able to do outside of the constraints of like national legislation. Um, but finally, uh, I do run up a kind of against, you know, what some, or at least I like complicate what um, some historians have said. Um, because one, I really focus on the local. I think that it's you know, while I do adhere to a lot of the macro um, arguments about how immigration enforcement unfolds in this period, at the same time, like my big contribution is, okay, but it's different depending on where you are. What happens in Chicago is not what's going to happen in Bakersfield, it's not what can happen in Texas, like ultimately um, how, you know, the Border Patrol is able to act and under what rules depends on kind of local conditions like labor, the political economy, the um, kind of like internal um, state structures. And, you know, you know, entire economies really kind of emerge out of deportation infrastructures, right? Um, and the reality of the situation is um, deportation infrastructures like an ICE detention center or any other kind of equivalent um, brings jobs to the area um, or, uh, you know, in, or it brings a promise of them. 
So that's one of the ways. The other way is that it kind of complicates, you know, this question of identity. Ultimately, especially in considering um, the last example I gave when the United Farm Workers are actually um, trying to get Mexican strike breakers deported. And some of these strike breakers are not just undocumented, they actually have um, documented uh, they actually have documents. I didn't really get into that because it's a really convoluted administrative process. Um, but if anyone's dying to know, I'll send you an autographed copy of my book in five to 10 years. Um, but ultimately, the, the complication is that, um, you know, Mexicans actually do not all get along. Um, history of deportation isn't just the state versus racialized others. Um, ultimately, you are seeing um, people like Robert F. Kennedy, who was a great, you know, uh, farm worker advocate, who was a civil rights kind of leader. I mean, he's also kind of advocating to have um, Mexican strike breakers deported um, in, in the hopes of trying to alleviate the conditions of Mexican Americans or like Mexican residents. Um, and then growers are like filing lawsuits against the INS's deportation saying, well, it's not fair for you to deport these farm workers, right? Because they're like the ones breaking the strike. So it, it, you know, it helps them. And they're saying, how can like the United Farm Workers be against like other Mexicans? Isn't this all a contradiction? Um, so yeah. And then, so the question it really becomes, I think this is relevant um, well into the 21st century. Well, I don't, I go all the way up to the 1980s and I stop there. Um, I do think that my work is important just because I think if we look at what the current situation is right now, about over half of, half or over half of um, Border Patrol agents are Latinos. Um, I don't know exactly how many are from Mexican descent, but ultimately, I mean, I, I think this is very, uh, I mean, it kind of, it, it, this is a problem, right? Um, if we really, if this is a category that is completely um, descriptive and one that we can all be behind and doesn't really make sense that this kind of historical enemy of the Chicanos and, and everyone else is now us. So I kind of look back and say, this isn't actually new. This is very like on point with history. And I think it's important to look at um, the intra-class and intra-racial um, tensions which exist. Um, and this is not at all to vilify uh, United Farm Workers in any way, shape, or form, um, but it is to just be honest about the situation, because ultimately, if you want to talk about labor rights, um, you know, racial rights, you need to think, you know, transnationally and think about the implications that um, kind of global uh, economic policy has in Mexico and in other countries, as well as here, which is a very, very difficult thing to do, right? I mean, we're essentially trying to figure out kind of global poverty, which is hard for someone like the United Farm Workers to do. So again, it's not to vilify, it's merely to learn about the, you know, the way that's, the ways that we have done this wrong. Um, so I think that that covers the general basis of what my work is and its implications. Thank, Thank you, you, Linda. Absolutely. Our next question, moving on, is for Brenda. Brenda, in terms of students not knowing of uh, many Latina leaders such as Lupe Angiano, what other Latina leaders do you consider unheard of? Uh, that's actually your second question. The first one, there was a, a question for you uh, as to whether or not you can comment on what Lupe Angiano has been up to in more recent times. All right, so Lupe lives in Oxnard, um, California, and she's a big environmental justice these days. She loves nature. She loves the beauty of uh, the Oxnard beaches. One of the biggest accomplishments that she did when it comes to environmental justice was um, there was this big mining company, I can't remember the name, but they partnered up with ExxonMobil, right? So that sounds kind of like bad news already. And they wanna build a pipeline from Australia all the way to the United States and it would enter Oxnard. What's in that pipeline? It's something called um, liquefied natural gas um, and if something goes wrong, it's very explosive. So that pipeline would go right through Oxnard, the residents of Oxnard. And if anyone's familiar with Oxnard, California, um, there's a lot of Latinos that live in Oxnard, California. And um, it's in between Santa Barbara and Malibu, right? Two different counties. Um, what she did was um, she helped organize um, I can't remember the name of the campaign, but to stop this big company from building this pipeline. Um, she got like the Malibu celebrities involved. She got some of the Santa Barbara celebrities and they were like picketing, protesting, and it thought they didn't build the pipeline. So yeah, she's up to things like that. 
these days. Very cool. And for that second question, um, in terms of students not knowing many Latina leaders, Brenda, um, what other Latina leaders do you consider unheard of? Oh, there's many. But um, I was on a panel um, in 2020 with um, at UC Santa Barbara, and some of the panelists were doing something similar. And one one person that may, may, some of you might know is Gloria Arianes, the Chicano movement, but um, one, someone lesser known would be like Alicia Escalante. Alicia Escalante is from LA. She's a welfare rights activist. And the, the person, the professor that um, is writing a book on her, her name is Rosie Bermudez from UC San Diego. So, um, we're gonna have more on Latinas coming soon. One last one that just, I thought about her because Lupe had a conflict with her is um, Marta Cotera from Texas. And she was um, big on the, um, 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 on La Raza Unida, which was um, a political party back in the day. So uh, Marta Cotera, Alicia Escalante. Um, also the women who founded Comisión Femenil um, those archives are in Cal State Northridge. Um, a lot of women that we can pick from that. Um, Comisión Femenil was a Mexican-American organization that focuses on uh, politically empowering Chicanas. So just women from um, founding. Um, yeah. That's yeah all and then some <laughs> older ones. Yeah, Rigoberta yeah. Menchú is another one. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And a couple questions for Omar. Omar, your first question, sir, why is the history of sports so important? Has the history of Mexican soccer or baseball, for example, influenced how you write about the history of Mexican boxing? I think it's important because um, in many cases, um, it's not normally seen as socially significant, right? Other than the meaning it has for uh, nationalist implications, right? There's a lot of nationalism involved, especially for countries like Mexico and others where they get a lot of their notoriety and um, influence that way, right? With their success um, in terms of Mexican soccer and baseball, there's a lot of good um, history on that, uh, especially um, Chicano baseball and things like that, <clears throat> excuse me. But um, I think I focused a lot on uh, Mexican boxing due to, of course, that personal connection that I mentioned, but also because of the success of Mexican boxing, um, you know, is a little bit better than Mexican soccer and a little bit than baseball. So there's that, but also um, it's very present in the public space and in um, our, con you know, contemporary sort of, um, I would say like uh, popular culture, but in academia, I think uh, there's place for it and there's room for it. And that's part of my argument in, in, um, in my research is that there's, um, uh, a place for it in academic uh, history that uh, Mexican boxing holds a place there, especially for ethnic studies and, and research. Yeah. Great, and I think you got a little bit into this question in, in your talk there towards the end as far as a how it exists in a structure of, of violence and manhood. But the question is, in the instance of boxing in this time period uh, was symbolized with death, why is that? Uh, what was it linked to? Is it associated with the mentality of manhood that they would rather die than accept defeat? Well, it's an interesting question because uh, it mentions a time period. Well, death, I think, has been associated with boxing throughout its entirety and through its existence, right, just because of the nature of the sport. Although I would add that uh, doing the, the research, um, which was something that was uh, new to me, was um, because although I didn't focus on regulation and the morality of the sport per se, the regulation aspect did come up a lot because, of course, when talking about death, that came up. Um, of course, there's been regulation throughout the years. For example, bare knuckle boxing is making a little bit of a comeback recently. But in terms of the history and how the sport had its trajectory to include like larger size gloves and things like that and regulation, right? Round limits, things like that. Um, the sport actually has had um, some more injuries and things like that because fighters actually are able to protect their hands now, right? So they're not, they're able to hit harder, last longer, et cetera. So in terms of the implications of, or the sim symbolism of death and things like that, and masculinity. I think that's always existed. And then, of course, yeah, I mean, fighters, they fight for many things. And some of the ones that I, uh, some of the major components of that 
I kind of pointed out, right? They they're fighting for their families. It's price fighting, right? So of course you're fighting for for money, but that's it, also there's a you know key components to that, right? They're feeding their families. I mentioned uh, the history of of Cuban um, you know migration, right, due to the revolution, um, and then also it's 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 a very low class sport, right? Uh, not to say that uh, middle class and upper class uh, people haven't uh, achieved success in the sport. But if you look at the history of, of the success of Mexican boxing and other Latino uh, countries, um, it's a very barrio sport, right? It's a very uh, low class sport. So um, in terms of, you know, not accepting defeat, uh, mentality of manhood, it's also, um, you know, it comes from that, right? From, from uh, trying to survive, right? So I think that's part of it, yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, I'd like to thank all our, our panelists and um, we have, uh, Time for a few more questions if anyone would like to drop them in the chat box. But uh, thank you to Linda joining us uh, again from a different time zone, staying up with us. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I loved all of this. I feel like I, uh, as an advisor, I always try to have students uh, be present in their sense of time and place. And why are we in this fourth annual Just Nieto conference? Why uh, have we had to be deliberate about carving out spaces to engage these themes that are about their communities and about people that look like them. So, um, and to have Bakersfield alumnus, of course, um, earlier in the week, yesterday or Tuesday as well, we had a professor from UC San Diego. It's, it's great to just see that extension of, of something that started with, with leaders um, like Lupe Angiano and Jess Nieto um, who, who made these things possible. Um, any closing remarks by any of our panelists before we, we close for the night? Definitely, Oliver is reminding us to come check out tomorrow's culminating events uh, for our closing day of, of this year's uh, Just Nieto Conference. Hey, and Andrew, thanks for including that link there in the uh, box. I, I believe there'll be a recording of this, which Andrew will make uh, available on our social justice website after a few edits, as well as get some copies to the panelists. Um, thank you all um, for this opportunity. I was glad to be with you tonight. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.